Hi, it's Money44 here and today I invite you to the review of the Well WE01A replica. The replica for the review was provided by Gunfire. There are more and more PCC replicas on the market, that is, pistol caliber carbines. And completely unexpectedly, this niche was filled by Well with its WE01A replica a lightweight polymer gun for its CQB games at a very attractive price, at least for the moment of making this review. If you've been interested in Airsoft for a while, you probably see some similarities between this replica from Well and the Nemesis X9 model from the Classic Army. There are a lot of similarities, but also a lot of differences. In today's review, as always, we'll see how the replica is built and what functions it has. We'll take a look at the gearbox and perform shooting tests. But we'll start the standard with a small unboxing. In a rather small black cardboard box with a carrying handle you will find a short instruction manual and a safely pamphlet, a speed loader, a small package of BBs of unknown weight, mid-cap magazine for about 100 BBs, a ramrod, TD and Stutamia adapter to be found in the stock, and the WE01A replica itself. Let's take a closer look at it. The replica measures 55 cm with the stock folded and about 61.5 cm with the stock unfolded. With the magazine but without the battery, it weighs only slightly less than 1.8 kg. The replica is almost entirely made of somewhat shiny but good quality polymer. The only metal parts you will find in the replica are outer barrel, selector, trigger, magazine release, dummy bolt release, front holding block, and the stock guides. Going from the front of the replica, we first come across a characteristic cookie cutter style flash hider. It's made of polymer and after unscrewing it, we'll see a standard 40mm counterclockwise thread. Due to the fact that it slightly resists in the grip, so we have a limited choice of accessories that can be screwed onto it. There will be no problem with tails which have an adapter, such as MTV fire, but if you want a silencer to hide in the grip, it cannot have a diameter larger than 34.5mm, just like the amplifier visible now. The polymer front itself is made in M-Lock standard and has three mounting points on the sides and bottom of the grip, to which we can mount wrist rails or other accessories in the M-Lock standard. While at the top it has a wrist rail through its entire length passing to the body of the replica. On the top rail there are of course folding polymer iron sides in the form of a vertically adjustable front side and a horizontally adjustable ridge side with choice of two holes. After folding the sides we have at our disposal a low front and rear sides, but it is impossible to use them for two reasons. One, they are too low and it's impossible to fold them, and two, the hole of the rear side blocks the view. If you rotate it again it rises the side up a bit, so I would count them only as a curiosity. I must add that those are the lightest folding sides I've ever seen, and I wouldn't be surprised if someone told me that they are fold themselves, for example while going through the bushes. On the polymer body the only markings we can find are those on the single-sided fire selector and serial numbers on the upper part of the receiver. On this side you will also find a dummy bolt release and a selector and on the other side a magazine release. The polymer charging handle is ambidextrous, when pulled back it opens the shell ejector window and retracts the dummy bolt, showing the rotary style hop-up chamber. By turning the knob down it increases the power of the hop-up and turning it up decreases it. The chamber has a marked side in which to spin, additionally on the knob you will find numbers indicating the power of the hop-up. The pistol grip has an interesting modern design and its texture makes it securely held in the hand. In addition it has a quick access system to the motor, just slide the lock and the grip base tilt giving access to the motor. The PDW stock has no adjustment steps, it can be either folded or fully extended. To unfold it, just press the button underneath, and the stock will spring back to open position by itself. In my case, to lock it, I have to push it back a little additionally. To fold it, you need to press the button again, and while holding it, push the stock to the closed position. As standard in the PDW stock, it has a clear play after unfolding. 
but also the place of fixing the stock to the body has a slight play in the axis of rotation of the buffer tube. The standard buffer tubes fit the replica, so I do not see any problem in replacing them. The place for the battery is prepared in the buffer tube. To get to it, you just need to pull off the plug. You will find here the wiring ending with TDN's plug. The compartment is unfortunately quite small. Turn it another tech 7.4V 1200mAh battery, after proper press placement went all the way in and even managed to pull the plug on. The same thing I tried to do with 11.1V 1000mAh battery, but with half success. The plug went in, but the wires pushed it away and I'm afraid that during the game it will fall off. The plug itself sits on the guide only by press fit, so I think that losing it during the game is not a problem. Personally, during the game I used a replica with 11.1V, 1200mAh battery and protected the protruding wires with insulating tape. Interestingly, during the creation of the review, one of the wires on the TDN's plug fell off. On the stock, as well as the whole replica, can be searched in vain for any point for attaching a sling. It seems to me that under the stock there is a place for so-called push-dot sling mount, but unfortunately it only looks like that. In the end, such a simple carabiner one-point sling I managed to hook on the stock or its guide. So let's say that it's possible to carry the replica this way, although it's rather not the way designers of the replica had in mind. The replica has a quick spring change system. You just have to unscrew the bolt in the stock guide with the Phillips screwdriver. And we have access to the spring guide. You have to push it in and turn it and you can replace the spring. The replica, despite its low weight, makes a good impression while holding in your hands, and this is due to its rather compact design and good quality polymer. If I were to compare it, it is slightly softer than one used in double yield replicas. With more pressure you can observe how the whole replica slightly bends, but without a tragedy. Interestingly enough, you can notice lateral play between the receiver halves. And while I have not noticed that it affects the performance, it should be kept in mind. You should also watch out for the front itself, because when trying to turn it, this one gave up quite easily. But it turned out that the culprit was an under-tightened front locking screw, and after tightening it, the front could not be turned anymore. The replica is compatible with magazines from Classic Army Nemesis X9 and GNG ARP9. The magazine from the kit is made of polymer and has a capacity of about 100 rounds. It sits in the replica very well with minimal side-to-side -side play. To pull it out, you need to press the magazine release on the right side of the replica. It does not fall out by itself and you need to pull it out. The magazines themselves should fit in a standard pistol magazine pouches such as the Primal Gear Scorpion magazine pouch seen here and others of similar design. A flat trigger is mounted in the replica and the shot falls almost at the very end of its path. Fortunately, it's not necessarily to let go of the trigger all the way to reset it but only that pull back a bit to fire another shot. Importantly, after a short training, we are even able to take a quick successive shots on semi. The selector had three standard setting modes. Safe, single fire, and continuous fire. And the selector itself works without unnecessary resistance and clearly locks in the modes. The replica has an installed fire control system, which can be programmed to one of several predefined presets, just like in the classic army Nemesis X9. The manual does not say a word about its programming, so let me show you how to do it. To enter the programming mode, you need to fire a shot on semi and a while holding still the trigger, wait for the beep. The first standard mode is semi and full auto. I press the trigger once and get the semi mode and free round burst. I exit programming by switching to auto and I can test my setting. The next mode is free shot burst on semi and full auto. The next mode is five shot burst on semi and full auto.
The last mode is semi on semi and semi on full auto. When the power supply is disconnected, the system does not remember the settings and returns to the standard settings of semi and full auto. The system at rest with the selector set to safe consumes about 18 mA. So when we do not use the replica I do not recommend leaving the battery plugged in because it will be discharged and damaged. Time to look inside. I start disassembling the replica by knocking off the front pin. Next, I can slide the upper receiver from the lower receiver. At it, we will look it in a moment. In order to get to the barrel along with the chamber, you only need to pull it backwards. The polymer from which the replica is made is very flexible. The rotorist style hop-up chamber is made of plastic. To take it apart, I pull off the clip. I knock out the pin from the arm. And pull off the arm with the spacer. The spacer itself is quite soft. The backing sits in the chamber quite tightly and it's slightly lubricated. Here it's worth adding that when the replica came to me, the backing was twisted, which I showed on my Instagram. So before shooting test and a game, I had to correct it. The backing itself is a standard with a medium hardness. As for CQB replica, I would personally install a softer one. The barrel is made of brass and it is 183mm long. Unfortunately, I do not know its diameter. I start disassembling the lower receiver by removing the stock. I pull off the stock plug and with a long Phillips screwdriver unscrew the screw in the stock and push out the washer along with the screw. Now I can pull off the stock. Then I pull out the spring along with the guide. The guide has a polymer cone and a metal base and a plastic shim instead of a bearing and the spring has a regular coil. Now it's time for the grip. I open the grip base, unplug and pull out the motor. It is quite standard with not too strong magnets, no less it gives a good response to the trigger and a large rate of fire. The grip itself is screwed on two screws, after unscrewing which I can remove the grip. The rear pin has to be knocked out. And the pin at the trigger. After switching the selector to semi, I can pull out the whole gearbox. Not only on the top of the body is flexible, the bottom is also easily bendable. It's time to look into the gearbox. At the very beginning, you can see that the manufacturer was generous with the grease, because it is even spilled out of the hole in the cylinder. After unscrewing the screws and disassembling the shell, we immediately see there is also a lot of grease on other elements. The shell itself has a lot of material in the rear part like JG shells. The cylinder window itself has a slightly rounded corners, which are supposed to reduce the shell's chance to cracking at this point. The shell has 8mm bushings installed. The gears as you can see are also bathed in grease, and before looking at them I lightly clean at them. The gears are in standard gear ratio. The bevel gear has 4 anti-reverse latches. The spur gear is completely standard. But the sector gear is a bit more interesting. It has a delayer installed, but more interestingly is the magnet installed, to which I will return in a moment. The gears themselves spin ok, but the shimming could be better. The replica is fitted with a MOSFET unit that controls the fire, and it's built from two interconnected boards. The upper board has an optical sensor responsible for trigger detection, and a magnetic sensor responsible for detecting the position of the sector gear. Here is also a large buzzer, which can be heard during programming. The quality of the board is ok, and it even looks to me as it is covered with protective paint layer. The bottom board has a LED that illuminates the trigger detection sensor. The trigger covers the diode, then a shot is fired. As you can see, the trigger movement is a quite long before it reaches the diode. On the other side of the circuit, we find another magnetic sensor. It is responsible for the modes of fire. The selector plate itself, despite the fact that it looks standard, hides a very small magnet needed for proper operation of the fire selector circuit. The system detects the cycle thanks to use of a magnet on the sector gear and a magnetic sensor on the board. When the magnet is under the sensor, then the system knows that the cycle has been completed. 
thanks to it, it's able to stop the replica after a shot on semi and as well control the number of shots with 3 and 5 round burst modes, so I bet it has an active break. Unfortunately, this also means that if we want to use other gears, then we'll have to reposition the magnet to new gears or use other MOSFET. As far as I know, and I may be wrong, there is a problem with installing a different MOSFET circuit in the classic army shell. Here there is no such problem, and the stock shell easily accepts MOSFETs such as Gate Aster, which sits in the shell well and whose sensors are not abstracted, and Jeftron Leviathan. This one is also mounted without a problem, admittedly it is an old version with micro switches, but even these do not cause problems. I do not have parent hybrid, but looking at these MOSFETs, I think it will also fit without a problem. It's time for the pneumatics, but let me clean those a bit too, because they are covered in grease. The polymer piston has 15 polymer teeth and only one metal one. Mounted on it is a Berngliss polymer piston head with only 4 vent holes. The polymer cylinder head has one o-ring and a rather hard bumper. It sits in the cylinder with visible play, but as you will see in a moment, it still holds a tight seal. The aluminium cylinder has a capacity reducing hole about in the middle of its length. The polymer nozzle has one o-ring and its length is 20 and a half millimeter. The tappet plate is quite flexible and has a very interesting looking fin. As you can see, it is quite different compared to a standard one. The whole system passes the syringe test on inserted nozzle, as well as fully extended. Before we move on the shooting test, let's go back to the shell for a moment. From the information I read, I learned that the front of the shell is thinner than in other shells and indeed. The thickness of the shell face is about 2.24 mm in well shell. In the Spesa Arms core shell, the thickness of the face is about 2.91 mm. In addition, I measured the face of the Eon shell from gate and here the result is about 3.01 mm. I even found half of the JG shell and the thickness of that was about 3.05 mm. So as you can see, the front of the well shell is actually much thinner than the standard, which can be determined to be about 3 mm, which is probably why the nozzle is shorter. I also read that the replica is not directly compatible with other shells than the original, and when replacing it with others, a lot of work is needed to fit it. I decided to check it out with two shells from both ends of the price spectrum. Currently, the, probably the cheapest shell on the market, that is Spetsarms Core, which I installed without too much trouble. And a representative of the high end of the price spectrum, that is Eon from Gate. This one also fit without a problem. However, it was not enough for me, and I decided to mount in the replica a complete CNC gearbox from Spetsar Arms with DSG gear. Pull it from my Spetsar Arms SIE 10. With this important gearbox has a 21.2 mm long nozzle. With original barrel and chamber, the result I got was an average of 0.81 joules, with the difference between the lowest and the highest result around 0.26 joules, or about 40 fps. That's quite a lot, but I had no problem with the BB's feeding and the test on full auto gave me a result of about 35 BBs per second on the standard motor from well. So I installed the chamber assembly with the barrel from E10. From the max model chamber I had to take off the mainspring because I couldn't close the replica. On this kit I got average result of about 0.79 joules and the spread between the results was about 0.3 joules or 46 fps. But I had no problem with the feeding of the BBs and the test on full auto ended with result of about 34 BBs per second. The control test of Spetsna Arms SAE 10 with this part gave an average result of 1.11 joules and the spread between results was only 0.08 joules or 10 fps. The conclusion I drawn from this test is that it's possible to mount another gearbox and hop-up chamber and will not have problems with feeding even with very fast builds, but you should expect that you will have to fit these parts to each very well. It may be a matter of just mounting a nozzle of the right length or it may turn out that some further modifications in the body or the frame will be required. Unfortunately, I do not have enough experience to say conclusively what causes such results, but I hope others will be able to draw more conclusions from this test. 
If you have installed a different shell and chamber in your WE01A and it works properly for you, then please share what you had to do to achieve this. I'm sure many people interested in this replica will find this information useful. But let's see what kind of performance we can expect from a stock replica. Chrono and shooting tests were performed before disassembling the replica. In them I used the Spesa Arms Edge 0.28g BBs and set the hop up for the given weight. Out of 20 shots fired, the average was about 0.99 joules and the difference between the lowest and the highest score was only about 0.05 joules. The rate of fire on Turnuji Nanotech 11.1V 1200mAh battery was just over 23 BBs per second. And on the Turnigi Nanotech 7.4V 1200mAh battery was just over 14 BBs per second. From now on, shooting tests will be performed differently than in my previous tests. Firstly, the target is smaller and with its size more resembles the size of a human torso. And secondly, the replicas will be rigidly mounted on the tripod so as to maximally eliminate the influence of the shooter on the test. So I start as standard with the distance of 30 meters. At this distance I didn't personally have trouble hitting the target. It was a bit windy so you can see that some of the BBs escape more to the side, but nothing drastic. The case was different at the distance of 40 meters. While the third dozen of shots flew well, at a certain point the BBs felt very much under the target, and an attempt to adjust the hop-up ended with some BBs hitting the target and some flying above it. However, when the BBs were flying equally, the hitting the target was as possible. At 50 meters, you can see that for the BBs to reach the target, the hop-up had to be set with a slight overhop. The spread of the BBs was quite large and a lot of BBs flew over the target and some fell below it. So hitting the target was quite difficult, but not impossible. From 60 meters the BBs may reach, but we can forget about any accuracy. So if I were to determine the most effective range on the basis of my piece, I will put it between 30 and 40 meters. What is the reason for such a large scatter? I think that the culprit may be an over-lubricated gearbox, which literally speed grease on the backing and cause uneven hop-up work. I base my theory on the fact that the replica was with me on one game and after firing about 300 to 400 rounds, the repeatability of the shots was much higher, so it's likely that it spit out what it was supposed to spit out and the situation normalized. The replica itself at let's say CQB distance that is not exceeding about 30 meters worked well and I had no major problems with hitting targets. Well, WE01A is a lightweight fully polymer replica. The material is quite soft and with greater pressure you can fill the replica bands. And here and there you can find clear plays. But the overall impression of holding the replica in your hands I will describe as positive. The replica does not give the impression of cheap toy as for example SIMA CM515. There is not much space for the battery and you will need to fit a small pack if you want to fully hide this battery in the stock, otherwise there's always electrical tape. The selector clearly locks into selected modes. The stock spring backs when unfolded but has only two setting lengths. In the replica there is no dedicated place to attach any sling. In addition to the quick change spring system, the replica has quick access to the motor and even programmable MOSFET. The inside of the gearbox was swimming in grease but overall everything worked as it should. The gears were shimmed well enough and spun without unnecessary resistance and the pneumatic parts are ok and hold seal. The gearbox is a bit non-standard to the thinner front, but standard parts can be mounted in it. The entire operation of the system is based on cycle detection using a magnetic sensor and a magnet built into the sector gear. So while the system itself works ok, it will not handle gears other than those having a magnet. So whether the gears are damaged or simply we want to replace them with for example a different gear ratio, you're forced with replacing the MOSFET or repositioning the magnet to the new gears. 
Fortunately, popular MOSFETs such as Gate Auster or Jephthon Leviathan fit in the shell and I'm even convinced that the Perron hybrid will go in, so there should be no problem. I recommend, however, to be careful with the wires soldered to the TDNS plug. The solder is very weak and during the review one of the wires fell off. While replacing the shell is also possible, that to get everything working properly may require either selecting the right nozzle or in the worst case, modifying the parts to fit together properly. And this may be a task for a more experienced Astrof technician. The performance in stock is typical for CQB in terms of power, thanks to which the replica can be used straight up the box in most Airsoft arenas. And the stock motor and on 11.1 volt battery gives a very nice rate of fire. Here I have to remind you that the replica had factory installed crooked hop-up backing, which I had to correct, and that during the shooting test it was characterized by a lack of even BB spinning. The latter I blame on the amount of grease in the replica, because after firing a few hundred rounds the hop-up calmed down. During the game the replica performed well and accurate hits at about 30 meters were not a special problem, and since this is a replica for CQB, then in my opinion there is nothing to demand more. What do I personally think about this replica? At the current price it is an interesting proposition for someone who is looking for a lightweight, compact replica for fighting at short distances, such as buildings or arenas, and doesn't want a replica from the AR-15 family or a standard machine pistol such as the MP5. It can also work well as a lightweight backup for a sniper. As far as the, for the use of the replica is concerned, I would recommend simply using it straight out of the box and not plan any big upgrades at the beginning. If something breaks, replace it and continue using it. The only exceptions to the rule is the hop of bucking, which in my opinion is a bit too hard for CQB replica and especially in winter may spin BBs poorly. Its place should be easily taken by, for example, ENL blue bucking or Mudbull blue bucking. As you have seen, the replica in general is compatible with standard parts, but if the shell breaks, then problems may start. If you do not want to risk a more reliable choice, especially for the beginning of your airsoft adventure, maybe the Double Eagle M904 that I have already reviewed, or any model from the Spetsna Arms Flex series. In general, the replica, because of its build, quality and slight surface difficulties I cannot recommend for new players. In my opinion, this replica will work better as an addition to a collection. If you are looking for something less standard for CQB games and which will not be particularly much upgraded, then as the first replica in which we would like to invest more. I am very curious what Speedsoft enthusiasts will do with this replica. It is very light and compact and also very cheap, so I can imagine what kind of speedy monsters can be built based on it. Of course, if there is no problem with matching parts. It will be all for today. I hope that today's video has left you with more answers than questions. And if you would like to know more, write it in the comments. Also, let me know how you like the Well WE0A and if you use it, how it performs for you and if you have done any upgrades to it. And for now, thanks for watching and see you next time.